The importance of being a Christian is summed up in three words. He has risen. And when we exclaim that he has risen, we're validating to the world, our Savior has done something that no other God has done. Can I get amen? He has risen is the calling card for all Christians. It is the calling card that galvanizes all Christians together. It doesn't matter if you're Baptist or Southern Baptist or Missionary Baptist. It doesn't matter if you're Episcopal. It doesn't matter if you're Assembly of God or Baptist or Lutheran or Methodist or Presbyterian or Catholic or Roman Catholic. When you hear the words, he has risen, that's something that causes all of us to get our marching orders because we may disagree on a lot of things, but we don't disagree on the fact that our Savior rose on the third day. It is the clarion call for all Christians to be one. Amen? We may disagree on a lot of things, but we don't disagree that our God is God. He rose from the dead. He has all power in heaven and earth in his hand like the scripture says. Amen? And when I talk about his legendary status this morning, because we're going to spend just a little bit of time talking about how great Jesus not was, but is. He's not a myth. He's not a fairy tale. He's not a fable. He is real. He's the one who died and rose again. He died for people who accept him. He died for people who do not accept him. He, di he died for people who accept him and then deny him. He is still risen. It doesn't take away from who he is based on the response that other people give him. Amen? The Bible says this in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. If you have your Bible this morning or your device, turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We'll read scripture together. Amen? And if you don't mind, we'll stand for the reading of God's word. First Corinthians chapter 15. We'll read verses 1 through 10, if that's okay. I love the Apostle Paul. I love his writing, and he just lays everything out in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. There are some passages that we will not have time to read this morning, but he said if the resurrection of Jesus Christ did not happen, he says that our faith and our living is in vain. He says that we are most miserable if Jesus did not get up from the grave. The Bible says this in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, when Paul was writing to the church at Corinth, they had so many issues going on with regard to speaking in tongues, and we know that they had issues with how they took communion, and we know that they had a lot of issues going on, and so he wrote an address to them in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, but when he got to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, he spoke a word to them that they could all understand, that they, it galvanized everybody in the place that Jesus is Lord. The Bible says this in verse 1, it says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also you are saved, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures 
and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures and that he was seen of Cephas then of the twelve and that he was seen of about 500 brethren at once of whom the greater part remain unto this present but some are fallen asleep after that he was seen of James then of all the apostles and last of all, he was seen of me also as one born out of due time. For I am the least of the apostles, that I am not meet to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace, which was bestowed upon me, was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all, Yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. While we're standing, we'll bow our heads for a word of prayer. Father, we thank you today for this great day today, oh God. We thank you for Resurrection Sunday today, God. We thank you for the resurrection that's happening in our lives even now today, God. We've come to celebrate what you have done for us today because there is no God like our God today, Lord. And we thank you today that you rose from the grave today. You rose from the dead today, taking your place, seated on the right hand of the Father today, God, forever making intercession for us today. We thank you that you are the great mediator. We thank you that you lived this life, and the Bible says that you sinned not today, God. We thank you today for blessing us and keeping us. We thank you that you gave your life in exchange for our life today. You gave your uh, pain and your life in exchange for our life. You gave your po prosperity for our poverty today, God. We just thank you today for what you are doing in our lives this day and forevermore today. We thank you today. We bless your name. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All those who agree with that prayer say amen. amen. As you take your seat, hallelujah. So the question is, what does it take to be called a legend? And so in our modern language, we often use the term to describe someone who has done something great in our eyes and someone who has excelled in their craft in such a renowned way that we believe the person or their life should be celebrated and talked about through the ages. That's, that's what we describe as someone who's a legend or someone who's legendary. And so what they've done is so magnanimous until we talk about their feet for days and months and years and generations to come. And so, for example, we use the word legendary when we talk about great basketball stars or great football stars or those who have excelled in the world of arts or music or dance or theater, we sometimes say they are a legend. Is this making sense? And so Merriam-Webster says this legendary, it says it describes something or someone that is well-known, famous, or celebrated for a distinctive or unique characteristic or skill. It describes something or someone that's well-known, famous, or celebrated for a distinctive or unique characteristic or skill, which is why we use that term even when we talk about people who play basketball. <laughs> we use that term when talking about people who play football. We use that term when we talk about someone that we think should be celebrated for whatever skill they have. Say, Jesus, Jesus. is legendary. And so to be a legend or legendary means you have paid the cost and you have endured the struggle, not just one time, but several times. You've done it over and over and over again. It means that your level of expertise is above everyone else's level of knowledge or expertise in that same area or field. Say legendary. And I'm getting ready to start something right now. I'm getting ready to start something. So with regard to basketball, People refer to Michael Jordan as a legend because they think that he was so skilled at what he's done. And I had to remind myself this, that Jordan retired in 2003. He's been out of the NBA for 20 years. And people still talk about him as if he's still playing. In fact, if you want to hear people argue, and you can go to any barber shop or church, and you can still hear them going back and forth over who they think 
is the greatest goat or, and who they think is legendary. Is this making sense? And, and so, so, but I'm here to tell you this morning that there is still one that's greater than Jordan. And so if we go to the world of movies, and I just picked one because I like him as an actor, if we looked at Harrison Ford, some people would say he is a legend. Some people don't realize that his career spanned over five decades. He's got 80 films underneath his belt. So we see him as Han Solo and in Indiana Jones and Dr. Richard Kimball. And so some people would say he's a legend. In the world of painting, we would say Leonardo da Vinci, who painted the Mona Lisa and who painted the Last Supper, we would say, he's a legend. Monet and Van Gogh, we would say, they are legends. In their particular field, they have excelled above everybody. However, the person I just want to talk about this morning <laughs> has excelled sailed in his field. And this is what you like about Jesus is that he just wasn't a painter. And he just didn't put a basketball through a hoop, excelling in a certain field. His field was life. And he excelled in every aspect of life. So, so now when you go through life, you can go to a legend because he has been through whatever you're going through and he is there to help you go through it, not just to survive, but to thrive. Can I get an amen in here? And so, and he is just not a legend who has died and we talk about him for ages to come. He was a legend who died, but it wasn't over when he died because on the third day, he got up. Turn to your neighbor and say, living legend. Because we would think, how can you be a legend if you are dead? Or how can we be a legend if you're still living? And we've heard that term, living legend, but it applies to our Savior. He's a living legend. Amen. There are people who may have wanted to give their life for humanity, but they weren't able to do it. He was the one who was able to do it, and he did it on our behalf. This morning, I've got three points that characterize the legendary Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Just three points, and then you can get to your, your Easter ham and your comfortable shoes. And so I know that there's a game that comes on today. I promise you, you will be out of church in time for the game that starts at 6 o'clock this evening. Amen? I'm, I'm just kidding. So my first point is this. Legends live legendary lives. Say, legends live legendary lives. They do remarkable things that others simply can't do. And in the process of them living, you begin to see legendary greatness in them. Because they couldn't be legendary unless they lived. The Bible says this in verse 3 of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. It says, For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. If you guys don't mind, I'm just going to teach a little bit. Amen. And so, because this is the Apostle Paul talking, and he said, I didn't deliver anything to you other than what God gave me. I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scripture, and that he was buried and that he rose again on the third day according to the Scriptures. Paul is saying, I didn't come with something new to you. I came with what, with what had already been established, what had already been canonized in Scripture. Verse 4 says, and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve, and that he was seen of about 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present. But some are fallen asleep. 
And after that, he was seen of James, then of all the apostles. And last of all, he was seen of me also as one born out of due time. And he says, for I am the least of the apostles that am not meet to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. When Paul begins to examine himself, he begins to look over his life before he met Jesus Christ. That's why he characterizes himself as the least of the least. If you know anything about Saul of Tarsus' life, you know that he was the person that persecuted the church with fervor. He would call Christians out and he would arrest them and he would take them to stand trial because what he thought what they were doing was wrong. So now that he's saved, he's saying, that's why I'm the least of the least because I look at my own life and didn't believe, can't believe what I was doing. He says, that's why he says in verse 10, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. It doesn't matter what you did before you met Christ. He says, by the grace of God, I am what I am. That you can come from all types of backgrounds and you can come back, come from all types of religions and you can come from all types of situations. And, but the day you met Christ, the day you meet Christ, your whole life can change. One of the reasons I wanted, I'm glad that the Lord had showed me 1 Corinthians 15 just to kind of pick it out as a scripture to share with you this morning is because it comes from someone who had a checkered past. He had a bad start to his Christianity. Say amen. Amen. But then he says, but by the grace of God, I am what I am because God's grace reigned prevalent in his life. Amen. Paul is saying it wasn't in vain when Jesus found me. And I thank him for that. Oh, I got to go on. I got to go on. Paul is saying all that I've done is because of the lifestyle of grace that he found in Jesus. Notice this. He says, I am what I am, meaning Christ invited me to do things that I never thought I would do. Paul said, I entered into a different arena in my life and in my thinking after I met him. I entered into a new life once I found him. He changed my life. Think about this. The day you meet Jesus, he can literally change your life. The Apostle Paul is saying, I was going 100% the wrong way until I met Jesus. He changed my life, and then I went 100% the right way. And so one meeting with God was enough to change Paul's entire life. What he's trying to share with the church at Corinth is that all it takes is Jesus. One meeting with Jesus. One lunch, one dinner, one breakfast, one evening with Jesus. And it's able to turn your entire life upside down. Say, he changed me. (laughs) The apostle Paul said, he changed me. What I couldn't do better on my own. And I thought that this might be my last time. And so he said, when I met Jesus, he changed me. Have you ever met somebody who stopped you in your tracks? Have you ever had a good mama that when you were doing something wrong and you went to them, they stopped you in your tracks? The Bible says that Paul was on the road to Damascus and he saw and heard, he saw a great light and out of the great light came a voice and it knocked him off of his horse and there was a voice that spoke out of the light that said, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And, and then he said, who art thou, Lord? And, and then the voice said, it's tough to kick against the prick. And from that day forward, he was blind. And, and the next thing you know, God sent him to someone who helped to restore his sight. And from that day forward, 
He was new. He was new. One moment with God can make you new. The reason we are here today is we spent a moment with God. What Paul found out is that this wasn't just a normal person. He was legendary. He was legendary to be in heaven, but still come out of the voice come out of a light, and then the light had power to knock him off of his horse. He's like, this is a livid legend. Y'all don't want to talk to me. That, that he had been gone, but now he's back. But he's not really back, but he's back. I don't know if you really understand that, how Jesus could be in heaven, but yet he still lives in you through the Holy Spirit. He's gone, but he's still here. And Paul says this, verse 9, I am the least of the least because I persecuted the church. He's saying I was so low until there was nowhere to go but up. And the problem is, until he met Jesus, he thought he was up. A lot of people run the wrong way thinking what they're doing is right. But this is what I want to make sure that I talk about before we leave. It says, verse 8, it says, And last of all, he was seen of me as of one born out of due time. Born out of due time comes from the Greek word ektrama. E-K-T-R-O-M-A. And it gives, the definition gives indication of of an abnormal birth. In some cases, it gives the the definition of a, a premature birth. Is this making sense? Paul is saying that I was so hard after what I was doing, I almost missed my birth. Because he's saying this, he said, I am one, it says, at last of all, he was seen to me as a one born out of time. Because he's saying that I didn't have the benefit of walking with Jesus like the other 12 disciples. But yet I was called. So he got to me after he had already gotten to them. So when he looked at the disciples, he said, y'all had the benefit of walking with Jesus and Jesus fed you and Jesus walked with you and anything you needed, he was there. He said, but I was the one that was born premature because you know that premature births, they don't have everything that the other children have because they're not functioning on that same level. But he said, I was one that was born out of time. That had it not been for Jesus meeting me on the Damascus Road, my spiritual life may have miscarried. That I may not have ever gotten here. I need to open your eyes to that because that's what he's saying. He's like, all that I am, for all of the preemie preemie babies, all all of the mothers that had to spend six weeks not being able to take your kid home because they weren't functioning at the level that they needed to function so that the doctors would release them. Paul was saying, spiritually speaking, he he, he caught me, and, and when he caught me, I was about to, I may not have been here. I almost aborted my own life, chasing hard after the wrong thing. So he says, I was born out of time. But he said, God is so good until even though you're out of time, he can put you back in time. So so not having walked with Jesus, God had to give him a revelation of who he was. When we think about Matthew and Mark and Luke and John and we think about all of the disciples, when we get to the New Testament, Most of the New Testament wasn't written by the people who walked with Jesus. It was written by the person who was born out of time. And God just placed him in time. Have you ever had God do something so special for you that you knew it wasn't your time, but God has a way of just putting you in time. And you thought like, I don't know how this is going to work for me because when I look around, all of the things don't add up. And then all of a sudden, what didn't seem to be your time is your time. 
Turn to your neighbor and say, it's my time. It's, it's, it's my time. You're like, well, how do you know it's your time? Because the season doesn't seem like it's your time and the months doesn't seem like it's your time. But when God says it's your time, it's your time. It's your time. I'm a living witness. I'm a living witness that when he says it's your time, do I, do I have any witnesses in the house this morning that when he says it's your time, it's your time. Even though you look around and you're like, man, I don't know how this is going to work. I don't know how we're going to get out of this. I wish I would have did that two years ago. I wish I would have did that four months ago. I missed my mark. I'm out of time. And God is saying, no, 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 no. Have you forgot? I'm the one who created time. I, I got to move on. I got to move on. I got to move on. That's his legendary. See, notice this. When you think about Paul, you didn't see Jesus doing the physical things that he did with the other disciples. He's so legendary. He met Jesus. He met Paul wherever he was. He said, I'm not going to walk with you physically, but I'm going to walk with you spiritually. And everything you need, I'm going to give it to you. Before I send you on your way, I'm going to make sure that you're functioning at a level that I want you to function at. So I'm going to put you in an incubator until it's time for you to go out. So Paul was thinking that I had missed out on something. And God is saying, you ain't missed out on nothing, nothing. His legendary greatness lives on because he lives on. Which brings me to my next point. Not only are le do legends live legendary lives, but legends never die. The, the great rapper Tupac Shakur said, people die, but legends live forever. You can go to a lot of churches and you'll never hear Jordan and Tupac in the same sermon. <laughs> but legends never die. The life that Jesus lived, it never dies. Yeah, yeah, and there have been some great people who walked the earth who have gone by the title of a legend because we have legendary inventors like George Washington Carver who found over 300 uses for the peanut, and we have Samuel Morse who, who invented a new language, and we have Thomas Edison who, who invented, invented the electric light bulb, and Alexander Graham Bell who invented the telephone. They all go by legends, but there's still one legend that's higher than all of them. And so uh, we have Wilbur and Orville Wright who helped to us to understand what flight is all about. And, and thank God we had Madam C.J. Walker She helped us with our edges. She helped us, she helped us with our edges because sometimes everything looks good, but sometimes the edges, it's the edges. I'm working on a sermon, it's called The Edges of Life because sometimes you can look pretty good, but, but it's... But we bestow the title of legend on all of them because what they did in their particular arena. It helped to change lives for generations. But if something goes wrong with the telephone today, you can't call Alexander Graham Bell. If something goes wrong with your car today, you can't call Henry Ford, even though you said he was a legend. And so if something goes wrong with your airplane on the tarmac, you can't call the Wright brothers. But if, if something goes wrong with your edges, you can't call Madam CJ. They were legends, but they've gone on. Oh, y'all don't want to talk to me. But there's one legend who was skilled in his craft. That, 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 oh, y'all don't want to talk to me. And he just didn't specialize in cars, although he's helped my car run longer. <laughs> he didn't just specialize in a telephone, although every time I call him, he answers me. And so he just didn't specialize in air travel, but every time I talk to him, he takes me a little bit 
higher. And so, and he just didn't specialize in hairdos. He went deeper than my hair and he touched my mind. Is this making sense to anybody? Because Jesus specializes not just in one field, he specializes in all fields. That's why when you call him, he's got wisdom and knowledge and understanding for you because he created you. Say, God's not dead. <laughs> so, so whenever you come across something in life, you can call this living legend because he's still alive because legends never die. Say, he's risen. When I think of Jesus, I think that he is the epitome of a living legend. They talked about him, but it didn't stop him. They hit him and buffeted him, but it didn't deter him. His followers left him, but he still kept going. They crucified him and tried to kill him, but they couldn't kill him because he wouldn't stay dead. Jesus rose from the dead. See, David was great, but David died. And Joshua was great, but Joshua died. Mary, the mother of Jesus, was a great lady, but she died. Lazarus was a friend of Jesus, who Jesus raised from the dead, but Lazarus died. And he did not get back up the way Jesus did. Say, legends never die. The Bible says, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 21, it says, For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. And Paul is drawing this comparison of Adam and Jesus. For since by man came death, through Adam man died. But then he said, by man, Jesus, came also the resurrection of the dead. Resurrection comes from the Greek word anastasis. And it means a standing up, a resurrection, a rising up, a rising again. Literally, it means to stand up again. Resurrection. Anna means repeat something or to do it again. Stasis means to stand, referring to a physical resurrection because when you use that term regarding Jesus Christ, he stood up again. Is this making sense? So, so resurrection means that you stood up once, and for whatever reason, you laid down, but if you're truly resurrected, you'll stand up again. Well, what I love about that is if Jesus is with you, when you go down, there's enough of him on the inside of you that it makes you stand up again even though you may not want to stand up again. Say, he's risen. <laughs> the devil had him in the grave, but he still stood up again. We are here this morning, not because we stood up, but because he stood up. Here's the deal. If he stood up, we can stand up. Because he lives, we can live. If he stands up, we can stand up. I love God because when no one stood up for me, <laughs> when people were pointing and people were accusing and, and people were talking and people were gossiping, when nobody stood up for me, he stood up for me. Y'all don't want to say amen to that. When the devil thought he got the best of you, he thought that he had given you a blow that would take you out. There's enough Jesus on the inside that it'll make you stand up, not once, but again, because that's what resurrection does. Is this making sense? And the Bible says, and having done all to stand, stand therefore with your loins girded with truth and you have on the breastplate of righteousness and you have on your helmet of salvation and your feet are prepared in the gospel of peace and you have your sword of the spirit and you have your shield of faith. And so when we come, we come ready. 
Having done all to stand, we still stand. I love Jesus because when he stood up, everything around him stood up. In fact, when he died, the Bible says that, that all of the, the graves began to open and they began to see bodies going around and they were waiting with expectation for one day to stand up. Say everything attached to him stands up. If you're attached to him, then you'll stand up. And if your finances are attached to you and you're attached to him, then your finances will have to stand up. And, and if your health is attached to you and you are attached to him and he stood up, then that means you're able to, to stand up. And if you got some kids mm -hmm, and they are attached to you, but you are attached to him, then they have no other recourse but to, to stand up. Is this making sense to anybody? He stood up. To death, he still stood up to hell. He stood up to the grave. And so he, oh man, this is so good. When he went out and met Lazarus at the tomb, he stood him up. And this is what he told Mary and Martha. He said, I am the resurrection. But he just didn't stop there. He said, I'm the resurrection and the life. The Bible says that the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus said in John chapter 10 that I have come that you might have life. Life in the Greek comes from the word Z-O-E. It means Zoe, and it means spiritual and physical life. All that life ever is. He says, I am that. So notice this. Jesus just doesn't allow you to stand up, and then he leaves you. He says, I want you to stand up again, and then I'm going to give you life. Because to have him stand up and then leave you, is, you're, no, you're no better off. He says, I'll never leave you, nor will I forsake you. If I cause you to stand up again, I'm going to bring life to you. The Bible says in the book of John, John chapter 1, it says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then it goes on to say, and in Him was life, and that life was the light of all men. If you have questions, you need to go to the life giver, because if you go to the life giver, He will shine light on whatever your issue is. Sometimes we don't have what we need because we don't have enough light. The scripture says, my people perish for a lack of light. If you would have known then what you know, you'd be better off. God wants you to stand up again this morning. You're like, well, I've already stood up once. He wants you to stand up again. The Bible says in the book of Romans that if the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead lives in your mortal body, there, there ought to be another standing, there ought to be another standing, there ought to be another standing up in here. Church, your neighbor say, you ought to stand up in here. <laughs> because Jesus is the power that helps you to stand up. I don't know if you have been as low as I've been, but there are sometimes I did not think I was gonna be able to stand again. I stood once, but I didn't know if I was gonna be able to stand again. And then along came Jesus. And he has too much power for me not to stand even when I didn't have the strength to stand on my own, even though people were trying to push me down, even though people didn't mean me any good, he still gave me the power to stand. Does this make sense? And I began to realize that it's not my strength, but it's his strength. So then I became like the apostle Paul, and I said, all that I am, I am because of him. Because I found when I was weak, that's when I was strong. 
Say stand up. Say stand up. Say stand up. So legends live legendary lives and legends never die. And my third point are legends are not legendary without witnesses. You got to have a witness. Even, even great basketball players have a witness. All the basketball fans, you know, you, know, you know who that was. There are a lot of people who have titles of kings, but there is really only one king. There's only one king for which we are all witnesses. If I were to ask you about your relationship with this legendary Jesus, you would be a witness. If I were to put you in a courtroom and put you on the witness stand and say, tell me everything you know about him, tell me what he's done for you, you would put your hand on the Bible and you would be a witness. (laughs) When I could not help myself, he helped me. When I could not find a job, he found one. When I wanted to pursue my education and I didn't have the money to pursue it, he helped me. When they told me I wasn't going to get a promotion, I got two. And and so, so I am a witness to him. I'm a witness. Say witness. The Bible says this in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 3. This is what I love about Scripture. It says, for what I received, I passed on to you as of the first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. He was buried. He's raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. And verse 5 says, and that he appeared to Cephas. Cephas is Peter. It says, and then to the twelve, because he wanted to make them a witness. Because all legends have witnesses. You can't be legendary and live in a silo. People have to see your legendary life enough to say, I'm a witness. People have to see what you've done over and over and over again to say, I'm a witness. People have to see that you're not just specialized in one skill and you do it one time and that's over. No, 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 no. Greatness or legendary status comes from doing it over and over again for people to say, I'm a witness. I was there the night he did that, and I was there the day that they did that, and I went to that game, and I went, oh, I am a witness. I got the tickets mounted on my wall at home because I went to that game where they showed out. He said, so he appeared unto Peter and then to the 12, and after he appeared to more than 500 of the brethren and sisters at the same time. So, so for people to say, well, I just don't know. I think, I think this Jesus was a fake. No, what Paul is saying is that he was a witness. And he said, Jesus Christ went out to all the other people, and they served as witnesses, most of whom are still living. And then he said, some have fallen asleep. So at that time, some were still living, and some had died. The Bible says, verse 7, then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, And last of all, he appeared to me also as to one born abnormally. Paul said, I'm a witness. I'm a witness to what he has done. And know this, and and what Paul did not interject, but what we read from other scriptures is that he appeared to Mary Magdalene. And remember, she thought he was a gardener. And he appeared to the two disciples on the road to Emmaus. And and so he was witness. This isn't something that he died. They put him in a tomb and they stole his body. He actually, if you can wrap your mind around it, he actually rose from the dead. He's legendary. Legends are legendary, but they can't be legendary without witnesses because legends make you better. Legends are not in it for themselves. All legends, whether it's sports, whether it's theater, whether it's movies, they all make you better. If you are around a living legend, your life should be better. They'll help you to accomplish what you can't accomplish 
on your own. They lift you up to a greater level than what you thought you could accomplish on your own. That's the great thing about being around a legend. And yet Jesus did what other people we call legends. Oh my God. The things that they could never do. Say never do. Jesus was able to pass to us the very thing that made him a legend. See, great legends are not able to pass to you the things that make them great. Gandhi was great, but he can't pass to you the thing that made him great. Mother Teresa was great, but she can't pass to you the things that make her great. Superman is great, but he can't pass to you the things that make him. But Jesus said, I'm getting ready to give you the very same thing that I have. I am so great, but the reason I'm great is because I've got this Holy Spirit that has anointed me and he has filled me and he is with me every step of the way. And you know what? And I'm going to give you what I have. And if I give you what I have, then I won't be great just by myself. The Bible says it this way. Let me give you some scripture. John chapter 14, verse 12 says, Verily, verily, I say unto you that he that believeth on me in the works that I do, shall he do also and greater works. See, don't you know that there are some great athletes who wish they could bottle up what makes them great and give it to their son? Don't, don't, don't you know there are some great Actors, thespians who wish they could bottle up what they have that makes them great and give it to their offspring. But it don't work like that. They're great. They may be a legend, but they don't have that power. That's why we're talking about the legendary Jesus Christ. Because he said, the thing that makes me great, I don't have any problem sharing with you. I don't have any problem. I'm not going to give you just a little bit. I'm going to give you everything, everything you need to be great. He said, I'm going to give it to you. He said, the works that I do shall he do also and greater. Say greater. Greater Greater comes from the Greek word mega, M-E-G-A. Mega means big. Let me help you understand mega. See, you just don't want to win the lottery. You want to win. Oh, you got it. You you got it. You, You got it. You got it. It's like when I go in, I want to pay that extra. I'm going to leave y'all alone. Jesus said, that which I do, you will do, and you'll do greater because I go to the Father. And when I go to the Father, I'm going to give you what I have. You can't be a legend without a witness. And let me leave you with this. Legends are legendary based on what they do. Say what they do. Legendary athletes are known for their statistical accomplishment. Legendary singers are known for how many albums and Grammys they have. And painters are legendary based on their drawings and the paintings that they sell and the price people are willing to pay for the painting because legends are legendary based on what they do. At some point in time, you got to have some stats. At some point in time, you got to have some numbers. That's what makes you legendary. And so that being the case, let's just look at some numbers, right? And so say one. Jesus said he's the firstborn. And so he's the firstborn of the dead. He is the alpha. Alpha is beginning because he is one. Peter said there is one name by which men must be saved. And so there's one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one spirit. When you talk about Jesus, you talk about one. These are his numbers. Can you say two? 
And so God put him here with a father and a mother. I want to point that out. Even though the father didn't do too much with regard to his birth, but he was still here as a living legend. Say two. Let's talk about 12. Say 12. They found this living legend in the temple preaching to the elders at 12. His mom and daddy lost him, and he, they asked him, where are you? Why did you leave? And he said, don't you know I must be about my father's business? And I don't know what it is with 12, but 12 is prominent in Scripture, right? Because there were 12 thrones, there were 12 gates, there are 12 everything. There are 12 disciples, but he's the first one. Can, can I tell you something? He started his social media platform with 12 followers. He, he found 12 people that would give him a thumbs up and, and they clicked on his page and, and, and they said, we want to be part of, of this social media campaign that you got going on. We're going to leave that alone. Say 39. 39 were the number of stripes that he took for me and that he took for you. He got numbers. <laughs> and so the law said you can only give 40, but, but what they said is that we don't even want to come close to going over 40, so we're going to stop at 39. And with each stripe, the Bible says we're healed. Say 39. Say he got numbers. Say 40. <laughs> we know that he was tested for 40 days and for 40 nights. And what we also understand is that before he went back up to heaven, he walked this earth for 40 days afterwards. That's how 500 people were able to see him. And that's how two people were able to see him. And that's how 12 people were able to see him. And that's how the 11 disciples were able to see him. And that's how he went through a wall when he had his new body. He's bad. Say he's legendary. Say 42. See, you thought 42 was just Jackie Robinson's number, but no, 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 it's, it's more, much more than that. And so there are 42 miracles that are listed in Scripture. Say, he got numbers. He turned water into wine, and he healed the official son at Capernaum. He helped his disciples catch more fish than they ever thought they could. And so he healed Peter's mother-in-law. He healed Bartholomew. He healed blind man. He healed people who couldn't hear. He healed people who couldn't talk. He got the stats. Y'all don't want to talk to me. He healed leprosy. There was a lady who had suffered for 18 years. But when she got in the presence of this legendary Jesus, he loosed her. There was a lady who had been hemorrhaging for 12 years. But when she got in the presence of this legendary Jesus, the Bible says her flow dried up. Y'all don't want to talk to me in here. He fed 5,000 people, men, not to include their wives and children, and to show just how bad he was, he did it for 4,000 just not too long after that. He got numbers. So you shouldn't be calling anybody legendary and they don't have, if they don't have the stats, they can't be legendary. Can I give you one more stat? Because we went to numbers one and two, but there's something about three. I don't know what you were doing, but on Friday, I was saying, boy, this is the day that it went down. And, and I know that even on, we call it Good Friday, but it wasn't good for him, but it was still good for us. And on yesterday, yesterday, I was looking outside and I'm like, oh boy, the devil don't know what's getting ready to happen. 2,000 years ago, the devil thought he had him. He was doing the gritty. But can I talk to you about three? Because <laughs> the Bible says, on the third day, he rose. 
He got up. Not on the first day, not on the second day, but on the third day. Turn to your neighbor and say three. Say three. And say, he got numbers. When he got up, you can get up. If he stood up again, then you can stand up again. You're like, well, Pastor Randy, you don't know what I'm going through, and the devil's got me, and I'm down on both my knees. If you're down on both your knees, that's a good thing. Because while you're there, you need to say a prayer, and before you know it, you'll be standing up again. Say, stand up! I got to go. Say, he got numbers. By most accounts, take your seat, by most accounts, he has approximately 2.5 billion followers worldwide. 210 million are in America alone. Say, I'm a follower. To, to, to give you something to compare it with, he has more followers than Selena Gomez and Ariana Grande and and Beyonce and the Beehive and, and, and Dwayne Johnson, who's the rock, but we know who the real. <laughs> Ariana Grande, she's grand, but she's not as big as. When you add their followers up, they still don't match the followers of Jesus. So, so, so let's leave that. Let's go, to, let's go to books. Do you know that he has the best-selling book? of all time. There are between five and seven billion copies of the book about his life because he's that legendary. They print 80 million Bibles a year. Say, he got numbers. (laughs) Matter of fact, we were talking about Leonardo da Vinci earlier. Do you know the painting that he painted of Jesus goes for hundreds of millions of dollars. That's just how good he is. If I were you, if I were you, if I were you, and realized that Jesus is the greatest brand in the world, I I wouldn't be wearing Nike, Puma, Adidas, Rolex, or Versace. I'd be wearing Jesus. I'd be wearing Jesus. On my job, I'd have on my Jesus shirt, and at home, I'd have on my Jesus shirt, and in the face of my enemies, I'd have on my Jesus shirt, and in the face of my frenemies, I'd have on my Jesus shirt, and when people like me, it's Jesus, when people don't like me, it's Jesus, when I'm employed, it's Jesus, when I'm unemployed, it's, y'all don't want to talk to me in here. And so, I get more identity out of wearing his shirt than I do wearing Sean John or FUBU. Y'all don't want to talk to me. You're like, well, I like my FUBU. Your FUBU ain't over him. I'm done. We'll stand on our feet. I'm done. I said you'd get out of here so you can go get your ham. Earlier this year, I was looking in the news and one of the NBA legends, Willis Reed, they said he had passed. And Willis Reed is most known for sitting out one game of the NBA Finals. I think it was game six. He played in game five and no one expected him to play game seven. And he came out limping. You guys can see the video. And they ended up winning a championship because of just his presence on the floor. And people said that was iconic. That was legendary. Because no one expected him to come out and play. And just his presence helped to catapult his team to victory. We serve someone greater than that. And I'm here to tell you that just his presence is enough to catapult you 
into your next season. You may feel that what I've gone through is too much. I, I, I can't come back out and, and I'm in the corner and this is the last go around. I want to throw in the towel. But if you know Jesus, he will help you come back out for one more time. Life is about not just standing, but life is about standing again. If you're here this morning and you don't know him, I want to lead you in a simple prayer. Because if you aren't standing the way you need to stand, he has enough power to help you stand again. Repeat after me, Father, in the name of Jesus, I come as a sinner in need of a Savior. Father, you said in your words in Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10, that if I would confess the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in my heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, I would be saved. Father, I thank you that on this Resurrection Sunday, I confess, I believe, I repent in Jesus' name. Thank you for saving me. Give God hand praise in here. Hallelujah. While we're standing, Father, we thank you for all those who are assembled today, God. We thank you for all those who are looking online today, God. We thank you today for being such a legendary God for us, a legendary God, but also a tangible God today, a real God today, Lord. And we just thank you today for making an impression in our heart that just simply will not go away. We thank you for your legendary life. We thank you that legends never die today, God. And we come as a witness to your glory. We come as a witness to the things that you have done in our lives. We come as a witness to the things that you have done, not just in our lives, but those that are around us, God. We thank you for taking care of our family. We thank you for healing today, God. We thank you today for bringing us all on one accord today. We thank you for the alignment that comes from the Holy Spirit, God. We just thank you for everything today. When we leave here, we ask that your angels of protection would be around us today, God. In all that we do, we give you praise and honor and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you so much for tuning in today. We really appreciate you supporting our broadcast. And if you've never had an opportunity to join us in person, if you're in the Oklahoma City area, we want to invite you to Impact Community Church. We're located at 4400 Northwest Expressway in the Cole Community Center. We have something for everybody in your family. Bring your kids, bring the entire family. I know they will love Impact. If you would like to sow into Impact Community Church, you can give on our website by mail or text to give. The information is on the screen. Thank you for your support.